Hi all, I have another very interesting and instructive Nimzo Indian game to show you today. The great Gary Kasparov was playing white against Levon Aronian. So this is in the St. Louis Rapid Tournament of 2017. Let's have a look at this game. D4 from Kasparov, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, allowing the Nimzo Indian the pin. And now Kasparov's favourite move, Queen c2. And how does Levon Aronian react? Well, Levon plays castling immediately here. Now after a3, gives up that dark square bishop. And now plays d5. This is quite a dangerous move, trying to gain tempos on the queen after d takes. If the queen ever takes b6 and bishop a6 is an often used uh, plan. So here after knight f3, we do indeed get d takes c4, queen takes c4, b6. Now in this position, Kasparov played a surprise move, perhaps to unsettle Levon Aronian's preparation. He actually played h4. And here, Levon decided not to play bishop a6, but instead try and keep more control over the e4 square. So bishop b7 here. Bishop a6 could be good as a token tempo game, but the bishop should really, it seems, return back to lock down e4 in this particular position. For example, like this, it should be uh, fine for black, even if, if the c7 pawn has to be gambited. Black has sufficient peace activity here and control of the position. So that should be dynamically equal. Uh, where black could go wrong, if e4 is allowed with the h4 move, uh, it could be something like this, where the king is inconvenienced, but uh, this is a really dangerous position. Uh, for example, any h6, there's e5 here, and there's the wrath of the h-file rook uh, emerging in this line. So this is to be avoided, absolutely to be avoided. White's getting a big advantage there. Okay, so the calm bishop b7, instead of bishop a6 in this particular case of h4, bishop g5, queen d5, offering c7. This is a typical gambit idea in this variation, rook c1. Just for the record, if queen takes here, knight bd7, and say this position, black's really getting active. Queen b5 seems to be a critical move, putting pressure on b2. And this is just super awkward, in fact, for white to handle. For example, rook b1, there's bishop e4, and then check here, and then taking off a3. And white's king is not happy here with the bishop and pawn over here. Black's getting a big advantage. Uh, so these variations are very, very tricky. So... Here, uh, instead of playing queen takes c7, rook c1, and after knight bd7, queen takes d5, bishop takes, now knight e5, c5. Again, it's it's pretty dangerous to allow rook c8 with the, you know black's rooks being active, so knight e5 is a calmer move. c5, bishop takes, knight takes, d takes, b takes, and again, white avoids taking material here because it's just going to accelerate black's development. Instead, f3, blunting the light square bishop. Uh, just as an example here, rook takes c5, rook c8. This position, well, rook fc8 is an example, with black's uh, rook getting active. This should be at least even uh, for black. Uh, it should be uh, enough pressure and compensation here. So black's going to get the pawn back as well. So f3, rook a, b8, e4. Okay, the bishop goes to a2. This tries to keep the bishop around in the opponent's position. If the bishop tucks away on a8, it's planted by the, by the pawn on e4. This doesn't seem fundamentally that, that good. And in fact, you know, for example, like this, white's going to get... A very very nice position a very very comfortable position uh, soaking up has to soak up the B the B file pressure though but why it's going to be able to increase the pressure here and this is clamping so why it's going to be better there so Bishop a2 rook c2 protecting the pawn Bishop b1 rook d2 <clears throat> rook fd8 a 
pair of rooks come off and that bishop b5 this is technically a loose piece on b5 perhaps safer is bishop c4 fundamentally it's a little bit more protected there but bishop b5 technically right now there's nothing wrong with it it's just that potentially <clears throat> potentially it might it might have an issue uh, so I mean for example bishop c4 bishop c2 this this looks as though white's doing absolutely fine here in these variations if the knight comes back to d3 supported by the bishop uh, then you know this looks actually very good for white what would be potentially winning that so yeah bishop c4 seems more steady but uh, bishop b5 knight h5 now there's a one or two tricks in this position to be aware of uh, that the black rook shouldn't be allowed really to come to the seventh and pick up a pawn under most cases and to do that it seems uh, quite an accurate move is needed because Marv played g4 this might be worsening his position maybe accepting bishop b5 is a little bit of a tactical liability going back here just to repulse knight f4 so for example knight f4 here King f2 and the, the thing is here with the bishop protected not as a target any rook d2 there's always king e3 just winning material there's no counter attack on this bishop uh, so this is a very interesting moment of the game uh, but to play that sort of move seems a bit strange a sort of backward move from what one played um, if we look at this again if bishop c2 then rook c1 and g3 again the, the knights can be repulsed and this knight can be brought back centralized and it's quite steady there it seems once again getting a big advantage so this did seem a, a, an opportunity for either bishop c4 also knight c6 technically this is a a good move for example just nicking this pawn <laughs> what yeah there's there's opportunities like that it's more tactical but um, g4 slightly loosens white and the thing is after knight f4 uh, we have now a tricky position king f2 was played and here f6 dislodging this central knight knight c6 and black's getting some compensation now after rook d2 check picking on this loose piece it's now an issue after king e3 rook takes b2 I mean if the king the king didn't really have much choice here. Uh, if it goes back, it's the, the rook's going to be lost on, on h1. So the king uh, steps forward. But, uh, yeah, losing b2 and losing this bishop. Rook d1. It's it's not over yet by a long shot, though. h6 is played. And here, white still has huge opportunities. Uh, g5 looks, for example, trying to punch a black's position. Uh, quite tricky uh, to handle this this kind of thing is going to be uh, quite dangerous for black there's going to be at least lots and lots of checks that should be about even uh, even if black has these pawns over here so anyway um, h5 was played rook b3 and it's important now to cross the bridge before the bridge is closed the br bridge is threatened to be closed of that rook eyeing d8 crossing the bridge rook d8 check because Smarf has played absolutely brilliant so far uh you know with with numerous opportunities for an advantage but here it's important to play rook d8 it seems uh to guarantee um, at least bailout draw opportunities if needed e5 should be even uh for example bishop d3 trying to drag this pawn uh down uh white's going to at least get perpetual check possibilities uh, for example possibilities like this uh, with a past h pawn there that's going to be at least equal so yeah crossing the bridge with rook d8 check it seems was the way to go here but unfortunately Smarf played e5 instead and now Levon plays a powerful bishop d3 this stops that inf infiltration of, of the rook the rook's blocked from black's king and meanwhile this c pawn is quite dangerous now we have a4 c4 knight takes a7 rook a3 knight b5 rook takes a4 king e3 f takes knight d6 rook a3 it's yes yeah, very dangerous with that past c pawn 
here. So knight b5, rook b3, the game actually ended here. Um, so if if it continued, the c pawn is very dangerous. After knight d6, king e7, for example, this position, black could cash out and show demonstrate this is a winning uh, rook and pawn ending by marching the king and then playing for rook b1. Why would be defenseless there? Okay, so yeah, the game ended on 36, rook b3. Uh, Kasparov didn't play on from that position. So this game actually has a very, very important variation for black against the queen c2 line. So take uh, d5. If we look at this uh, variation, this is one of the core cool lines uh, presented in uh, the excellent free course you can check out at Kingscrusher TV slash Nimzo. So a lot of trainable variations, all for free to check out there on the short and sweet course. So that's a short and sweet to check out at Chessable. And it has this line with um, the queen coming out for b6, a very interesting idea to gain tempo with bishop a6. It seems, yeah, there's been uh, numerous ways of playing the position in the past. d5, though, is becoming trendy uh, with the top players, it seems, as an alternative to things like b6. So d5 is the trendy move at the moment to look out for, which this course emphasizes. So you might want to check that out if you're a budding Nimzo Indian player. Well worth checking out. Okay. Thanks very much.